I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Nathan Donnelly, who's going to give us an update on what we're learning about the presence of PFAS in pesticide products. Uh, Dr. Nathan Donnelly is the Environmental Health Sciences Director for the Center for Bio Biological Diversity's Environmental Health Program. They work on issues surrounding the increasing exposure of both people and wildlife to toxins. Before joining the Center for Biological Diversity, he worked as a scientific researcher in the Oregon Center for Research on Occupational and Environmental Toxicology. There he was studying the links between exposure to environmental toxicants and cancer. Dr. Donnelly holds a doctoral degree in cell and developmental biology from Oregon Health and Sciences University. Thank you, Nathan, for joining us with this update today. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here today talking about uh, some research that uh, some colleagues of mine have put together over the last year or so. Um, and I just want to mention some of the, the data we'll be presenting today on, on the slides um, uh, are currently under peer review right now. So they're, you know, should be considered preliminary data. Uh, just want to be upfront about that. Um, so next, I want to talk today about PFAS and pesticides. And before I jump into pesticides, I want to make sure we're all on the same page about PFAS because there's things have been changing in this field uh, quite rapidly. Um, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what PFAS are and are not. So PFAS is just an acronym for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which is a pretty meaningless term. Uh, it's incredibly broad and it's been interpreted very differently by many different organizations uh, around the world really. Um, and even been interpreted differently by the same organizations over time. Uh, so there's just a lot of a lot changing here in what is or is not considered a PFAS. Um, I would say most people, when they think of PFAS, think of specific examples of PFAS like PFOA, PFOS. These are the you know most infamous examples. Uh, long chain PFAS, incredibly persistent, incredibly harmful. PTFE, which is that nonstick coating in your frying pan and in that bottle of Scotch Guard that uh, you know your mom used to spray on the furniture to to make it stain resistant, Gen X is what's called a shorter chain PFAS, it's supposed to be a, a replacement for PFOA, and it's turned out to be just as persistent and just as harmful. So these are kind of you know the dirty four, if you will. Um, but the more we're looking about, the more we're learning about the persistence and and the toxicity of some PFAS molecules, um, it's become very clear that we need to be looking at at more than just you know the worst of the worst examples. Um, so on the right here, you'll see uh, a structure of PFOA, and the C's are carbon atoms and the F's are fluorines. And you'll notice that it's basically just a long chain of carbon fluorine bonds. Um, this is called a long chain PFAS. It's got you know seven or more fully fluorinated carbons in its chain. Uh, it's a pretty nasty molecule. Uh, there are also short chain PFAS, which has, you know, fewer than seven carbons in the chain. And then a subset of short chain PFAS are ultra short chain PFAS, which have one, generally one to three fully fluorinated carbons in the chain. So I'll be talking a bit about chain length um, as I go on along in this uh, presentation. So just be aware that you know, the PFOAs and the PFOSs, those are long chains. And we've got shorter chain things like Gen X. And then there's ultra short chains, which, uh, you know, just one to three fully fluorinated carbons. So there's two really main PFOS definitions in use in the US right now. And this has been relatively recent. So a few years ago, the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, it's an international standard setting agency that EPA and many regulatory agencies around the world often look to, to develop their own thresholds and definitions and so on and so forth. So um, it's a highly regarded organization. The OECD definition here, I want to refer to as the scientific definition. Um, it was developed very transparently 
published in peer review by a group of researchers from around the world. Um, so I'm going to refer to this as a scientific definition. The OECD definition is basically any molecule that has at least one fully fluorinated carbon. And what that looks like is just a CF3 group on the side of the molecule, or in some cases, a CF2 group. Um, this is in use now in some states who are opting to, to regulate PFAS above and beyond what the feds do. Um, it's also used in some other countries around the world. Um, on the other hand, we have what I'm calling the regulatory definition. So this is a definition developed by the EPA chemicals office again a few years ago. Um, and it is any chemical that has two adjacent carbons with varying degrees of fluorination at the very least will meet uh, the regulatory definition of a PFAS. This is used again in federal regulation. Um, and while these definitions look kind of similar, uh, they're actually very different. Uh, the OECD definition is very broad. It covers about 20,000 or so different molecules we know to be in existence. The regulatory definition uh, encompasses about 7,000 or so. So um, it's a much more narrow definition. Um, and we don't quite know the origins of this definition, the regulatory definition. Um, and that to me is, is a major red flag. So moving forward in this talk, I'm gonna be using the OECD definition of a PFAS, uh, but just know that there may be some disagreement um, just based off of differing definitions that the different agencies are using. So while the fuss, you know, who cares if a molecule is fluoridated or not, right? Uh, well, it turns out the carbon fluorine bond is, it, it, it doesn't exist in nature. I mean, there are a few, of course, exceptions, but for the most part, any chemical out in the environment with a carbon fluorine bond is generated by humans and released as pollution. Um, and so that means that no biological processes have evolved to break down that bond. It's incredibly strong. Bacteria don't break it down. Fungi don't break it down. Algae don't break it down. Sunlight doesn't break it down. Heat, pressure, it's just it's just there, it's not going anywhere. And that's really worrisome from a persistence point of view. Um, so that's why PFAS have, have earned the moniker forever for chemicals because you know that highly fluorinated portion of the molecule is going to exist forever. Uh, you know, we're talking uh, your grandchildren's grandchildren will be encountering the same molecules in some cases that we are encountering today, which is really worrisome. Um, and the, I will say the very few PFAS that have been studied in any depth um, are, again, very persistent and really incredibly toxic at very low doses. So it's, it's an issue that, that deserves our immediate attention. Next. So how did these nasty forever chemicals get into pesticides? Uh, it turns out there's a few categories here um, that they can be broadly bumped into. One is that some PFAS are intentionally added to pesticide products. Uh, the pesticide makers are putting them in there um, and, and you know, they want them in there for you know, the chemical properties that they have or, or whatever. And then there are unintentional ways that PFAS are uh, included into pesticides, uh, ways that the pesticide manufacturer did not necessarily intend on. So I'll give you a few examples of these moving forward. Uh, next. So I'll start with active ingredients. This is again, intentionally added PFAS. So active ingredients are the primary component in the pesticide. It's what is, it's the chemical that is killing the pest that you are targeting. It's the main ingredient in the pesticide product. Um, and so for this, what we did was we looked at all conventional active ingredients that are approved by the US EPA uh, in, for use in the United States. So conventional ingredients um, are, what you think of when you think of a pesticide. It's the stuff used in agriculture. It's the stuff used around people's homes to target things like insects and fungi and weeds and stuff like that. Uh, we're not looking at biopesticides, which are things like natural extracts or living organisms that are used often in organic agriculture. We're also not looking at antimicrobial pesticides, things like bleach or triclosan, which are used you know, to generally sterilize indoor environments. So we're just looking at conventional active ingredients approved in the US. There's about 500 or so. Um, and I'll direct your attention to the green bars here. So this is looking at all the 500 active ingredients approved in the US right now. 
about a quarter are organofluorines. Organofluorines are just molecules that contain at least one carbon fluorine bond. So about a quarter of active ingredients approved in the US uh, have at least one carbon fluorine bond, which is pretty high. Um, and then if we look over at the second column there, uh, the green bar again, about 15% of active ingredients approved in the US, conventional active ingredients, are PFAS. Meet the scientific definition of a PFAS, which that's like one in seven. That's really high, much higher than we were expecting to see. Um, but the trends are looking much, much worse. So the blue bars now are just looking at all conventional active ingredients approved just in the last decade. So we're looking at the most recent approvals. Over 60% are organofluorines. It is now the norm uh, to fluorinate active ingredients. That is the trend in the industry. That is what they are moving to. Um, and about one in three, you know, almost a third are PFAS of, of recently approved active ingredients. So, you know, we're seeing this, um, you know, this seems to be desired by chemical manufacturers now to uh, fluorinate uh, and in some cases highly fluorinate their active ingredients, which from a pers persistence point of view is, is pretty darn worrisome. Uh, next. So what does that look like? I would say most, <laughs> almost all of the PFAS active ingredients just have a CF3 group, just one fully fluorinated carbon attached to the molecule somewhere. So it meets the scientific definition of a PFAS, but most of them do not meet EPA's PFAS definition. Um, some of them do, do though. Uh, there's a handful, uh, maybe two or three, that actually meet EPA's definition, um, and they're pretty gnarly looking. This is broflanolid up here is approved just a few years ago, um, highly fluorinated, highly persistent. We're talking about soil and water half-lives of five to six years. So a half-life is just how long it takes for half of what you put into the environment to break down. So we're looking at, you know, if you spray this in the environment, it takes five or six years just for half of what you spray out there to begin to break down. And that's just the time it takes for one of these bonds to break. So, you know, then the clock starts over. So what we're looking at is likely over decades, this thing will be slowly chewed up into the environment until we're left with, you know, probably that top flooring structure, maybe even that ring structure with the other flooring attached to it. <clears throat> and that's not going anywhere. That is a terminal degradate. We're talking about <clears throat> half-lives on par with, with DDT. <clears throat> um, again, highly persistent. Very, very worrisome that we're seeing these structures um, represented in active ingredients right now. Next. So I'm going to switch gears now looking at um, inerts. So we're still looking at intentional addition of PFAS. Inerts are every other ingredient in the pesticide product other than the active. So things like dyes, fragrances, surfactants, emulsifiers, propellants, things like that, anything else other than the active ingredient is, you know, quote unquote inert um, um, as an inert ingredient. Um, and they often account for the bulk of the product. Some products are like 99% inerts, uh, other ingredients. So um, they can be really a, a, a major source of, of, you know, the chemical addition into a pesticide. Inerts are shrouded in secrecy. There is little to to know transparency about what products these inerts are in. Uh, they're not required to be um, put on the label. The public has no clue what inerts are in pesticide products. Um, healthcare workers have no clue what's in the inerts, uh, what inerts are in pesticide products. So it's from a, from a public right to know point of view, very worrisome. Um, we know what active ingredients are in products, but we have no clue about any of the other ingredients. That's considered trade secret confidential business information. Um, but we have been able to glean a few things from public records requests via FOIA. Um, <clears throat> it looks like there are about 11 fluorinated uh, organofluorine inerts registered with the EPA, and eight of those meet the scientific definition of a PFAS. So much lower numbers than we were expecting to see, which is a good thing. Um, However, one of these is, and you can go to the next slide here, PTFE, uh, which is the, you know, better known as the brand name Teflon. 
uh, this is an approved inert ingredient in the United States that you know is present in some pesticides. That non-stick coating in your pan is present in micronized form in some pesticide products that are approved in the U.S. Uh, very worrisome. PTFE is highly, highly persistent, um, and spraying it out in the environment in a broadcast fa fashion is is incredibly worrisome. So I'm hoping that this will get canceled very soon. So we've got eight PFAS inert ingredients um, uh, approved in the United States. Um, and we actually more recently identified how many products these inert ingredients are present in. This is again, information through uh, public records requests. Um, and the good news is it doesn't look like they're in all that many products. Right now, the eight PFAS inert ingredients approved in the US are present in a total of 55 pesticide products. And we even looked at Canada. Uh, they have about seven PFAS inert ingredients approved in that country that are present in just 41 products. So given that we have 20,000 or so pesticide products approved in the US, these numbers are very small and that's, that's really good. However, I wanna highlight the lack of transparency here with inert ingredients because we don't know what these products are. They could be products that are very lowly used, or they could be products that are used across millions of acres uh, across the country. So um, I want to caution that this isn't necessarily good news, um, although the low number of products is great to see. Um, these could be widely used products. We just don't know. EPA won't give us any information on what products contain these inert ingredients, because again, it's considered confidential business information. So all we have is the number of products these inerts are in, uh, and that's it. So I'm, again, hoping <laughs> moving forward, uh, we can get just a little bit more transparency here to the extent the EPA is able to, to try and figure out, okay, what products are these in? Are these very widely used? Give us something here, because uh, again, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty here with inerts. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, now we're looking at unintentional addition of, of PFAS into uh, pesticide products. And it's looking like container leaching is gonna be a, a major pathway for that to happen. So a little history here. Um, a few years ago, peer public employees for environmental responsibility found levels of long and short chain PFAS like PFOA and GenX in parts per trillion, parts per billion concentrations in multiple uh, mosquito insecticide products that were being used in Massachusetts and the state of Massachusetts confirmed that. EPA did a little uh, rooting around and decided that this contamination was likely coming from the containers that the pesticides are housed in. So it turns out that pesticides <laughs> are pretty caustic and, and they can actually over time start to break down high density polyethylene that they're being housed in. Um, and one way that, that manufacturers have gotten around this is to fluorinate those molded plastic containers. So what you do is you put them in a chamber, you hit them with fluorine gas at real high temperatures and pressures, and it changes the carbon hydrogen bonds in the polyethylene basically to carbon fluorine bonds on the edges of those containers. So you're basically putting in a, a PTFE coating on those containers um, by fluorinating it. Uh, the problem is, it, and it, it works to, to, you know, make it so that these pesticides aren't chewing up that plastic over time, but it produces PFAS. Um, and this is now really a well-established pathway that PFAS can get into uh, contents that are housed in these fluorinated plastic containers just by leaching from the edges of those containers. If you've got a pesticide product, and you put it on your truck and you ship it across the country, it's gonna be jostling around. You know, as you drive through Denver, it's gonna be exposed to really high pressures. As you drive through Phoenix, it's gonna be exposed to high temperatures. All this is gonna promote leaching of those PFAS that are adhered to the sides of the container into the actual pesticide liquid itself. Um, and that's worrisome, right? Parts per trillion and parts per billion concentrations may sound very low, but when we're talking about PFOA, that is actually very high. You know, some of these long chain PFAS really need to be thought of along the lines that we think of dioxins. 
very harmful at very, very low doses. So parts per trillion, parts per billion concentrations is, is of human health relevance there. Um, and, you know, we know that that fluorination of, of rigid plastic is not just happening for pesticides, this is happening for food products too, which is, is really quite worrisome. Next. So now, a few years have passed, multiple groups, including my own, uh, have found parts per trillion and parts per billion concentrations of long chain PFAS in pesticide products um, using a, a third party certified lab. So this is Eurofin Scientific, which is one of the labs that kind of helped helped write the book on, on PFAS testing back in the day. Um, we're finding levels of long chain PFAS that are not approved active or ingredients, so they shouldn't be in pesticides. We're still finding them in some pesticide products, and it's really worrisome. It's looking like some of this is coming from container leaching. Um, recently, EPA has, has done its own testing um, and failed to reproduce some of the findings that, that um, uh, has been identified through Eurofins. So the, the pesticide office has been doing some of their own testing of pesticide products, and they're not finding PFAS that other labs are finding. So there's lack of reproducibility here which you know is is worrisome for me and so it, it really highlights the need for us to figure this out and standardize um reliable testing because we need to be able to reproduce results and that's not happening right now um you know given the persistent nature of especially long and short chain pfas uh we need to figure this out quickly uh and i'm hoping that our regulatory agencies are are taking this as seriously as as I really think it should be. Um, so container leaching is clearly uh, one major pathway that long and short chain PFAS can get uh, introduced into pesticide products. Um, but it's looking like there are other unknown sources. Um, and the reason I think that is because the testing that has been done that has been finding some of these long and short chain PFAS and pesticides are also finding long and short chain PFAS that are not known to be produced via container leaching. So container fluorination produces carboxylic acid PFAS, but we're finding some sulfonic acid PFAS in some of the testing that's been done. Those are not, absolutely not coming from container leaching. So there appears uh, to be other as of yet unknown sources. Um, Possibilities include, you know, impurities from other ingredients that are being put into these products or just simple contamination of the water that is being used to dilute these um, pesticides in, in the bottle. Um, we're not quite sure where these PFAS are coming from, but it's looking like container leaching is, is not going to be the only pathway for these really nasty ones, the long and short chain PFAS uh, to begin into pesticide products. So. Again, a lot more work needs to be done here. We need to figure out how these compounds are getting into pesticides because we need to get rid of it immediately. Next. So I talked with you uh, 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 earlier about active ingredients, PFAS active ingredients. I wanna go back and touch on that again. Um, Cause a lot of people might be saying, who cares if a active ingredient is a PFAS, right? EPA has done the risk assessment They've assessed risk. They've made sure that that approval has been done in alignment with federal law, no unreasonable adverse effects to people or, or the environment. Who cares if it's a PFAS or not, right? EPA has done its due diligence. The problem is, is the risk, assessment, the risk assessment process is not really designed with persistent chemicals in mind. But I would say most pesticides, uh, certainly the majority, are not highly persistent. Um, and the risk assessment process is really designed um, to look at the parent pesticide molecule um, and a couple of the, the degradates that are formed early on and, and not much else. So EPA guidelines right now require that if you are a pesticide maker, you need to submit studies to the EPA to analyze degradation of your pesticide, which is good. Um, the problem is those experiments last at most four months. Um, so we're looking at degradation over the course of months. Um, that's fine for some pesticides, um, but I would argue for fluorinated structures in particular, um, chemicals that have, you know, half-lives, or at least they're degradates that have half-lives likely in the decades or centuries, this gives an incomplete picture about what's happening. We can't really tell much 
four months down the line about what is ultimately happening to these guys. What are the terminal degradants, the fluorinated terminal degradants that are going to be around forever? We simply don't know that with a lot of these pesticides. Um, and, and sometimes even highly persistent degradants that are known to be formed are ignored. And I'll give you a few examples. One is sulfoxiflor, which is a, a PFAS AI active ingredient. Um, in EPA's risk assessment, they acknowledged that there is a highly persistent fluorinated degradant that is, you know, coming from the sulfoxiflor parent that is, meta you know, from the parent metabolism into this highly fluorinated, highly persistent degradant that was likely to accumulate in the environment over time. EPA looked at a few acute toxicity studies to aquatic invertebrates and decided that it was not as toxic to those organisms as the parent sulfoxiflor molecule. So they said, it's not a risk. We're not going to assess it further. Um, same thing with bicyclopyrone. Again, you've got multiple highly fluorinated, highly persistent degradants being formed. EPA didn't even look at studies in this case. They just did a structure activity relationship with these degradants and said, well, it doesn't have the active structure that we know is responsible for bicyclopyrone toxicity. Therefore, we're not going to assess risk from it. So, you know, kind of worrisome. I mean, there's a ton of uncertainty there. Just because it's not toxic on an acute basis to aquatic invertebrates really tells you absolutely nothing about its toxicity to other taxa, to people. Um, and again, if these are highly persistent, we're talking about half lives in the decades or centuries. If you're wrong, if this is really toxic, it turns out that we find that out 10 years later, there's nothing that can be done. You can't reverse this. So the uncertainty involved in what degradants are formed, how toxic they are, um, really necessitates that we need to be monitoring for these guys. And that is just not happening. So if you look at this little table over there, we have about 66 conventional PFAS active ingredients approved in the US. Only 13 of those have been monitored in water by USGS. USGS did a great extensive study about 10 years ago, actually a series of studies where they looked at about 230 different pesticides and their degradants across 500 streams in five different regions in the US. Really extensive stuff. But they only monitored 13 for 13 of these PFAS active ingredients. That's about 20%. And of those 13, they found 12. Well, a couple of these were just found in one or two streams. Most of them you know, are some of the most widely detected pesticide water contaminants in the country. Things like bifenthrin and isoxaflutyl and fipronil. Uh, trifloxystrobin, sialothrin, you know, contaminants that are showing up in, in waterways across the country. Um, and, and, you know, we just don't have a good sense of what degradants are being formed from these. Um, and we're not, you know, the federal government is not really monitoring uh, most of these out in the environment at all, at least in water, which is, is very worrisome. I will also say that, um, it's looking like just from the structures of some of these active ingredients, one likely degradant from most of them, one likely terminal degradant is trifluoroacetic acid or TFA. Um, TFA is a widespread uh, uh, pollutant across the world, really, showing up in water, showing up in food samples, showing up in human serum, urine, uh, drinking water. Uh, it's really kind of everywhere, and it's just now being appreciated as being a, you know, serious part of the total organic fluorine load in the environment. Um, and it just so happens to be a degradate of many PFAS active ingredients, and that degradation could be extensive. So the German Environmental Ministry a few years back, which is Germany's EPA, looked at TFA in the country, and they looked, they found that they had 28 PFAS active ingredients approved in the US. So there's only 28 approved in Germany. Of those 28, uh, Germany found that, you know, up to 500 tons of TFA could be produced just from the degradation of those 28 active ingredients in the country. Um, given that we have 66 <laughs> uh, PFAS active ingredients used in the US, and we probably use many orders of magnitude more pesticides than Germany does, uh, um, I think, Pesticide degradation is a, a major source of, of TFA 
in the environment. Uh, there are certainly other sources as well, um, but this is worrisome. And since you have dozens of PFAS active ingredients likely ultimately degrading into TFA, we need to be assessing the cumulative impact of that. The problem is, is there's no cumulative impact assess. EPA is taking a chemical by chemical approach. Um, and when they're all degrading into the same thing, that can be worrisome. There could be risks there that you don't understand if you're just doing a chemical by chemical approach. So I'm hoping that with some of these fluorinated active ingredients, EPA can undertake a more extensive evaluation because it's, it's certainly warranted. And again, like I said, any release of these highly persistent degradants into the environment. Uh, again, trifluoroacetic acid, TFA, has a half-life of 200 years. We are talking about something that is just not going to break down. Um, and it's getting into our bodies. It's getting into drinking water and food. It's being found in wildlife and remote areas. Uh, again, very, very worrisome. Next. So I'll just leave you with this. Um, this is a quote from a colleague of mine, Dr. Kyla Bennett. Um, so it's looking like, like unintentional contamination, and right now we're assuming uh, to a lesser extent inerts are the likeliest sources of long-chain PFAS like PFOA, PFOA, PFOS, um, and then, you know, in the case of inerts, PTFE, again, is an approved inert that's present in pesticide products that are used in the U.S. Um, active ingredients are, are clearly the major source of what we're calling ultra short chain PFAS. So this is one to three fully fluorinated carbons. And they're present in much higher concentrations. When we're looking at parts per billion, parts per trillion concentrations of some of these longer chain PFAS and pesticide products, active ingredients are present in parts per hundred concentration in these pesticide products. Uh, so, so much more concentrated. We know from estimates from USGS that we use at least 23 to 35 million pounds of these PFAS active ingredients each year, every year, year after year in the US. And that's just from 2018 data. There are many more that have been approved since then. So I think it's likely we're looking at between at least 30 to 40 million pounds used each year of PFAS actives, since many of them have been approved more recently. And again, only 20% of them have been uh, uh, actively monitored by the US government in water. Um, and the ones that are detected are some of the most widespread pesticide water contaminants in the country. Again, whatever we put it out into the environment today, even if we think it's benign today, uh, tomorrow that could be a very different picture. Um, and there's no reclaiming what we're putting out in the environment. There's no reversing it. It's done, uh, which makes the, you know, makes this something worthy of really figuring it out and getting right. And I'll just leave you with this. If the 60s and 70s were the age of the organochlorine, things like DDT, aldrin, chloridane, we're living in the age of the organofluorine right now. Um, and, and there are going to be legacy impacts, but what those impacts are is just not understood right now. And that's scary. I mean, DDT is still one of the most widespread pesticide contaminants in meat and dairy in the country. And we haven't used it in 50 years. So, you know, we're talking about legacy impacts here that we can't even begin to comprehend right now, even with, you know, compared to most chemicals, a lot of the study that's that's been done with, with some of these pesticide active ingredients. There's just a lot we don't know, and that uncertainty really worries me. So that's all for me, and uh, happy to, to take any questions from anyone if you have any. Thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, you certainly make a compelling case for concern, uh, and it's clear that this topic is still nascent in the science and the complexity of the risk assessment that's needed for this. Uh, really a strong case on those points. So uh, we are coming close to our time here. Just a question or two. We understand that the company that has been the primary producer of the fluorinated containers has been ordered to uh, stop that process. And the question is, do we know that there are other providers? Are there other containers that perform well enough 
that there's an easy replacement there. W what is the replacement picture? Yeah, there are replacements. So for those of you who don't know, um, EPA a couple weeks ago just, just took action to um, basically order the company that's producing all these fluorinated containers to stop producing PFAS. Um, and since you can't really fluorinate containers without producing PFAS, it's basically a, you know, a, an action to stop the production of, of fluorinated containers. Uh, and that's supposed to take effect February of next year. So it's coming up. Um, so that's a great action. I mean, you know, a very strong, bold action from EPA there um, um, that could really cut down on a source of, of PFAS and pesticides as well as food uh, and, and other products as well. I will say that, um, you know, the, the company has challenged that action and uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals just stayed that decision. So uh, that won't go into effect until the court comes to a conclusion on the legality of EPA's action here. Um, and since it's, uh, you know, one of the first major actions under the, the newly uh, revised Toxic Substances Control Act, I wouldn't be surprised if it made it all the way to the Supreme Court, to be honest. So, uh, you know, read into that what you will. Um, but suffice it to say, there's there's a lot of uncertainty now on on what whether that action will take into effect or not. If it does, I will say that it will cut down on a, a major source of contamination of PFAS in, in pesticides, which is great, particularly long chain PFAS. Um, and there are other options. Uh, I'm not, you know, that familiar with them. Um, I know one option is to sort of do what's called an in mold fluorination. So instead of taking your plastic containers and then blasting them with fluorine gas, you kind of do the process while the plastic is being molded. Um, and that, uh, at least as far as, as a few studies have suggested, does not produce PFAS, uh, at least to the extent that post-mold fluorination does. So there are other options. There are also non-fluorinated uh, ways of, of you know, making barriers in these plastic containers. So I really hope EPA's action takes effect, um, but we won't know for some time un until that, that, that will take place or not. Okay, well, that sounds like a positive development. Uh, and maybe that's a positive note that we can end on here. Uh, we could talk with you for hours, probably. Unfortunately, we're up on time. Once again, there's a few questions in chat and Q&A that you might respond to. Some interesting questions about biological processes for breaking down and whether there's any potential for biological remediation or mitigation for PFAS. So if you can visit those, uh, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes, well, thank you so much for that, Nate. And maybe we'll be back again next year with another update.